If you enjoyed the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. What was it like transitioning to the GR1? Uh, I mean, the actual transitioning bit itself was not real. I mean, Tornado was a brilliant aeroplane, a fantastic aeroplane. It was nice to be able to see out the window, but also a bit challenging. You know, get used to the idea of being able to see where you're going again or, uh, and everything else. So, but uh, a great aeroplane all around Tornado. The challenge really was having done this role here, where you had that level of independence and responsibility, including real operational tasks at that time as well, and every sortie you came back, you were judged against what you'd done. It was a little bit different when you get to a tornado that, uh, yeah, you fly a pair, a four ship or an eight ship, whatever. So you're always going with somebody else. You're never going very far. The level of responsibility is lower. Um, and, you know, you, you fly around the country, you pretend you hit the target by looking at the radar film. Whereas I could tell where I got the target up by looking at the actual film. And then when you go to the range and you bomb on the range, tornado system was so accurate that if you were missing the target by very much, there was something wrong with the system. And it wasn't you, you know, unless you're really a dullard, because the system was so good. Uh, don't get me wrong, it was, it was really very enjoyable, a fantastic aeroplane to go and operate, especially when I got back to Recce Tornado with two squadron. Could you tell the power difference uh, uh, from the camera to the Tornado? Of course, I mean, of course, there's a, a power difference, a power difference between it. Um, but this thing, it, it flew the speeds it needed to fly to do the job it needed to go and do. You know, people talk about Tornado being Mach 2. Very few Tornadoes have ever been Mach 2. You don't need it anyway. And you can't even fly Mach 1 at low level. It's stupid. You know, there's a certain speed you can fly at low level, at 100 feet, that makes sense. So this whole idea of performance, that's really got nothing to do with it. It's got to do really with the ability to get there, hit it, and get back again. You know, so the speed is just a component of that equation, really. Uh, I really enjoyed my Tornado flying. Uh, you know, it was a, a great aeroplane to go and operate without a shadow of a doubt. But as a lifestyle, this was, was a better lifestyle as a squadron. Mm -hmm. And you say, because of the places you went and the things you did, really. Did a lot of Canberra guys just transfer to Tornado? Quite a, quite a few of the recce Canberra guys transferred to Tornado. Um, when I first got there in the early 80s, I was on the first squadron, nine squadron, there was a bit of an issue. Uh, it was a bit of a buccaneer mafia oh, on yeah, the yeah, early Tornado. Yeah. Um, and so if you're not buccaneer, buccaneer you don't count. Uh, and so I've said, you came from Canberra. No, I came from Recce Canberra, you know. And so your ideas on tactics and everything else didn't count because you didn't count. Whereas for us, our whole aim in this thing is don't be found. Whereas some of the fast track guys wanted kind of to be found. So some of the extreme maneuvering they would do was really kind of giving their, themselves away. Whereas we would try to well, sneak around. Sneak around and don't get found. Uh, and that kind of didn't go well, down well with some of the guys on the, on the squadron. <laughs> So did you ever fly the Tornado in live theatre? Uh, I didn't fly in the Gulf War, I went in, in Dural, Op Dural. So uh, yeah, not the same as some of my colleagues who've been heavily engaged. Because obviously most of my Air Force career, up till 94, we were really still Cold War. Um, which was very much a both sides knew what the other could do and both sides left each other alone. And it's only with Gulf War One onwards, when the Air Force has been operational every day of every year, that things have been you know, more uh, entertaining in that respect. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really see much of that. I mean, I've been to some interesting places in this, some which I can't talk about. Um, but yes, tornado-wise, yeah, I did Dural, and, and that was that. But you enjoyed it, I'm sure. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it, you, you, you do what you do, and you try to get the best performance out of, out of the airplane and, and the crew you fly with. And, and certainly there were some, some challenges operating the airplane. Flying tornado was relatively easy, both front and back. Operating the airplane in complex scenarios, especially if you're the package commander for a lot of airplanes, is where it really becomes a, a challenge. Mm -hmm. And we always said that if it goes according to the plan, it's actually quite boring. It's only when it starts getting different, the plans to change. You go to a tanker for a two-point two tanker, you get there, only one hose is working. What do you do? 
Do you take less fuel? Do you take, how do you, what do you do this? Because what matters is the time on target isn't going to change. How many people do you get there on that time is all you can vary. Yeah. We have one over uh, Iraq where our F-16 sweep uh, suddenly decided they weren't going to come. Yeah. So you've got to say, well, actually, I'll, I'll swing roll the F-18s to be the fighter sweep, and I'll lose that SEAD component from the F-18s, because the F-14s can pick up the slack from that. So while you're sitting there on the tanker, you're juggling all these things, deciding what to do. You can't go, well, stop the clock, I want to go home. <laughs> you, you've got to juggle it and, and make that work. So those bits became more interesting. We didn't have that with this, because really, we never dealt with anybody else. We went on our own to sell our own thing. So juggling all those things to make it work was, was quite interesting. And when I was an instructor at Finningley, those are the kind of things you try to build in the scenarios for the students. It's not can you cope when it's all going according to plan? It's can you cope and not give up when it stops going according to plan? Mm -hmm. And that's what matters. So Ken, you also had other roles such as squadron historian. How did that come about? Well, it came back because I arrived on the squadron in, uh, in 1977 and uh, every month the squadron has to write a document called the Operational Record Book. And they have a squadron historian that does that and anything else. And I arrived on the squadron, they hadn't done it for six months. And because my degree was ancient history and archeology, span the boss decided I'd be the closest into a squadron historian. <laughs> so I started doing the ORB. Um, I then started also looking at the history of the squadron. And, and 39 had a really interesting history. And bearing in mind in 1977, there were still guys around from World War I, the interwar period, and of course a lot from World War II. So we organized a squadron reunion in 1978 and had about 100 uh, old boys and their wives and, and girlfriends came back. And it was phenomenal to actually look at the history of the squadron and, and listen to the matter of fact way some of the guys talked about what they'd, what they'd done in, in World War II. So that's how I got into my first book. My first book was called The Wing Bomb, The History of the Squadron. And that was only because of all the great stories I'd picked up from being on, on 39, talking to all the veterans there. That must be brilliant. And you're also the founder of the Aviation His, uh, History Research Centre. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Yeah, so, so again, having done the, uh, the, the, the piece on 39, I then kept that whole aviation history bit going up to that point. I hadn't really bothered too much about it. But I then realized that a lot of these stories were being lost and that we needed to capture the stories and share them. So I then got writing articles for Fly Pass magazine, you know, writing other books and so on. Eventually became editor of Fly Pass magazine as well for, for a number of years. Uh, and now there are about 50 odd books as well. But then I started saying, well, actually, with the move to the digital era and online stuff, then the ability to share things is important. So we formed the, the AHRC bit based on that really, that people can then share documents, photographs, stories, and then we can, we can reshare them. So that's, that's the idea behind that AHRC bit. And part of what we're doing here now with Russ Rain and with the station headquarters building is that there'll be a, an aviation research center inside the, the building here as well. Brilliant stuff. And you mentioned your books there. Where can we find them online? I think generally, uh, I think about half of them are still in print. They're, they're all pretty much online. You can find them occasionally, put them on AHRC. Uh, my son's company, Wing Bombed uh, Customs, he produces, uh, sells the books as well on, on his site. So you find them if you go to Wing Bomb Customs, their website has got them on. Um, and most bookstores. In fact, I delivered some this morning to East Anglia Books, Marilyn. She's got some today that she's selling at a show at Skullthorpe. Okay, so from your position now sitting inside the, the airplane, you're sitting on the bank seat. So obviously you're sitting in a black hole, but if you needed to get out, you've got a handle between your legs, one above your head, and in theory then what will happen is the hatch above you will, will separate and go. If that doesn't, then explosive cord will detonate the hatch and blow the hatch up. If that doesn't work, you'll actually punch through the hatch. At least that's what it says on the, on the tip. <laughs> If you look forward now to where you are, this is where the navigation piece sits. This big orange piece here is the actual recce viewfinder. So under the nose is a prism, 
and you've got a handle on the right hand side allows you to turn that to look fully forward which is what we use at low level vertically which is what we'd use doing any of the medium level stuff because you're not tracking the camera at medium level you're tracking the airplane over the ground and then you know the angle that the air the camera is looking at so that's how we calculate the standoff from the target we want to know which target we're at what height can we fly and then we actually track a line on the ground through the tram lines on here i can actually turn it backwards as well and see under the airplane so i can actually see the underside of the fuselage on this recce site as well so People often think it's a radar, but it's not. It's a, a straight visual viewfinder. The rest of what's on the front, only half what's in here is what was there in my day. So this right-hand side here, basic flight instruments up here, they've not changed. The main nav computer here is called a TANS, Tactical Air Navigation System. That came in as part of the late 70s modification. This piece here is missing. This is the Sky Guardian. So that's a radar warning equipment. We had a different one in my day, a straightforward RWE, but that's missing because it was still classified, but we think we found one to put in. This side here, obviously a main compass, a GM7A compass, fuel. And then down this side it's missing is the Omega. So the late period navigation kit was actually the Omega. And then, because you've got self-defense systems now, you've got a flare dispenser here that allows you to dispense flares and a little um, smiley face on the drawn on the, on the button. And the pilot's got one of those as well. And then while you're sitting in there, the table will come out and sit on your knees, and that's where you do all your, all your writing and your, your recording of your in-flight reports and things on the, on the knee. To the left-hand side of you here, this is the camera control panel, and this has changed almost entirely since my day. The top set of buttons here, these are the F-95 tactical cameras. Even though in the later part of the squadron's life they weren't using them, they're still in. But all the other switches I knew, setting the F-96 cameras and everything else, have all gone. Um, there's a couple other camera settings in here for some of the more modern cameras. This tray here, in my day, was a System 3 in the two aeroplanes we had it, but in later life, again, was a different, a different camera. And to show you the age of the aeroplane, of course, we have the good old-fashioned fuses down here as well. So your first port of call when something didn't work was to go in here and, and, and change change the good old fuse. And the, the, the oh, no, not got one in, but let's find one with a fuse in it. Oh, someone's taken all the fuses out. So <laughs> no, just the big, and now they're all gone. And then on the right-hand side is primarily communications. And again, there are a number of holes in 135 because they were late period um, radio communication equipment that has gone. In fact, the biggest hole is actually the oxygen regulator. We've got one of those to go in there as, as well. So some of what you see there is, is very old fashioned radios. Some of it is, is more modern radios as well. So primarily that's how it splits down is between radios on the right, cameras on the left, navigation on the, on the front. And obviously if you need to push the hatch off, you've got a handle here. If you were to push that down, that just pushes the hatch off from above your, your head. If you just look over your right hand shoulder, you can see the avionics rack behind you. And if you went far enough back, that's the well the pilot could climb down if he put the autopilot in. We have one guy once put the autopilot in, got down the hole, wiggled forward, and tapped the navigator on the shoulder. <laughs> Frightened him to death. You don't expect anyone to be able to tap you on the shoulder when you're sitting in this airplane. And what did you call these uh, day night indicators? Yeah, they were, they were euphemistically known as day night indicators because basically, that all they really gave was an indication of whether it was light outside or dark outside. It isn't, as I say, quite that bad. At low level, they were quite good for the targets. And of course, you have artificial lighting in the airplane as well, which we will wire up again in this airplane. Brilliant stuff. So we got some personal questions here yeah. from me. Yeah, you can. So do you have any hobbies? Well, apart from, uh, well, looking after the airplane, uh, doing the, uh, the SHQ bit, I'm a trustee of the RF Heraldry Trust. So uh, organized units that have badges, the official badges, then we research the history of the badge, why is the badge the shape it is, the color it is, the, the, uh, the motif and the blazon that they've got on the badge. Because the Air Force has been awarded just over 1,300 badges in its history for squadrons, stations, groups, commands. And the trust is basically repainting all those badges now to have a long-term preservation wow. for them, of which we've done about 850 so far. And again, the trust will have a, a room in the SHQ here as well. I do that, I'm a volunteer researcher and guide at Marham, Heritage Centre at Marham. Um, yeah, so I've got a few things on the go, yeah. I think I know the answer to this one, but favourite aircraft you've flown? 
Right, it's got to be the PR9. But again, if I looked at it operationally from the point of what was the most fun aeroplane, Tornado is the most fun aeroplane. The most fun role and squadron is 39 and the PR9. It's a bit of a double answer, really. <laughs> yeah. While I was fly past, of course, I was very lucky. I flew in Mustangs, Spitfires, B-26s, all sorts of things as well as fly past editor. And that was, that was quite entertaining and enjoyable, especially flying types where I'd met veterans who'd flown them and written stories about them. And so flying in it, or at least even sitting in it, gives you a much better perspective on what they would have done at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, 39 Squadron flew bow fighters in the war. And when I was at the RF Museum on secondment, I was able to get and sit in their bow fighter. And, and it made a real difference to the understanding of talking to people like John Manners, who'd been a navigator on bow fighters, uh, and some of the stories he told. When you sit in the airplane, it gives you a completely different feeling and view for that story. One you would like to fly either past or present? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, people say, you know, what, what, do I want to go fly in the two Spitfires that are around? Not particularly. I'm not that interested necessarily in going to fly in a, in a Spitfire. Perversely, actually, one I quite like to go and have a go in is, is, the, is um, Bristol Fighter. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Again, because uh, again, the 39 Squadron have flown Bristol Fighters, and I've done quite a bit of work on the Northwest Frontier Province of India and air power in, in there, and the Bristol Fighter was involved in that. And it's just one of those airplanes that has that sort of interest. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So can we find yourself or any of the projects you're working with online, social media, Facebook? You can. So, I mean, uh, we've got uh, Facebook pages for most of what we do. So we're about to launch the West Rainham Facebook page now, West Rainham SHQ. That's a, a charities project to develop the building for a, a research centre and charity use. And so that's looking for volunteers and eventually donations. Um, this, this one, XH135, has a Facebook page. So that's just look for XH135 and Aviation History Research Centre as a Facebook page as well. So there's various places you can find, you know, find information about that. Yeah, I'm going to link it in the description below. But Ken, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's all right.